All right, here we have the fourth issue of Knock. You can see on the spine there an old school gaming bric a brac, issue number four. On the back, just has a little bit of flavor text there. Each issue of Knock has a dust jacket on it that is removable. So if we take that off for a second, you can see the uh, the cover here, it has knock on it. Uh, it is a soft cover style zine or book. It's, it's actually quite dense. It's over 200 pages, I think 210. Uh, on the spine, they got a little D6 table there. They you make clever use of the space throughout the, the zine, so it's really great. Uh, and then on the back, there is a table. So very cool setting the the issue aside for a second we can take a look at the dust jacket because that itself has a lot of information in it as well we can see that the mary mushman the publishers of, of knock have turned this into a sandbox for the module the lost city before by tom moldvay i personally haven't played it but um it is a classic and it gives you a lot of different information on how to turn that into a more sandbox area. You got the map with the keys and a bunch of different supporting random tables to really flesh that out. And then it also comes with one other handout, uh, this little K-octahedron, uh, where I think you can cut it out, kind of form this little die. You can roll it and have these different effects going on. And I believe on the back, you could maybe make up your own if you are interested in doing that. All right, taking a look inside, uh, we have some, a lot of great artwork throughout the book. We have a forward. And then your contributors. So a lot, like, as I mentioned, a lot of this content comes from different creators in the osr throughout their blogs or different areas that they post their content a lot of great art artists that contribute to this so you can find all of those contributors there here is your table of contents so lots of different articles articles are generally i want to say random in nature it is a bric-a-brac magazine so there's no like major coherent themes throughout it um, so, you know, if you're looking for information, you got to kind of know which zine it is in, uh, but they always do have at the end sections, menagerie of monsters. So that's new monsters you can use in your games, retinue of rogues. That's new player classes you can use in your games. Extraordinary excursions are different adventures you can use and try out. And then they added a special section into this edition called welcome to the old school, how to care for and nurture your 5e friends. So after the OGL debacle of last year in 2023, they have added this section in to help convert players to the older styles of play if they are interested in making the switch from fifth edition. Test, test. So looking at one of the first articles that I found interesting was the Hobbit as a setting. So the idea is if you just look at the Hobbit, not the Lord of the Rings, how would that play out as a campaign setting? And Josh McCrowell does a great job of breaking that down, uh, identifying the main themes, treasure hunting, journeys, uh, singing. There's a lot of songs throughout The Hobbit. And then what, what is the setting like? Different rules that you could add in. What are the characters like? So there's humans, hobbits, dwarves, elves, elf friends, goblins, great animals, lots of things like that in the article which are great next article is how do you do exploration right by chris mcdowell of electric bastion land fame uh, gives some great information on how you might want to consider exploration in your games in search of better travel rules also by josh mccrowell so talking about how to make travel more interesting uh, instead of kind of sucking as he has identified and then breaking out what are you know bad travel encounters, good travel encounters. Next, we have this interesting article by Ben Milton of Questing Beast. This comes from his uh, latest edition, second edition, Knave, talking about your knavish duties. So different uh, roles for the referee and different roles for the players. 
great reminder on being a good sort of teammate and, and player at your game table and things that you should do. I really like this article by Morgan Miller about making good rumors and later dungeons. It gives you a nice kind of framework to design rumor tables for your dungeons or locations of interest. And then once you kind of have built out your uh, table, you can, you know, and what, what rumors are true, which are partially true, which are false. You can then use that to flesh out a dungeon for your players to explore. So you're kind of using these ideas first to help give you a sense of what your dungeon is actually like and what it's going to uh, entail and what's going to, what the content in its inside is going to be for your players. So very fun article there. I really like that. I like having rumor tables and different tables that sort of support that kind of emergent storytelling and giving your players different information so they can make their choices and go from there. Joseph Manola talking about localism, the adventure as a microclimate. This is kind of talking about how your players might have encountered only one type of lizard folk. Maybe they live only in one small spot of your setting. And if they're killed, then they're just gone. Or if they travel somewhere else, the lizard folk that they find in a different spot are totally different than the lizard folk in the first place they found. And this just sort of kind of gets away from that sameness that you can often find in a lot of campaign settings where elves in one place can be the exact same as elves far off from another which you know we know in just through human history is not true right you go to one region it's going to be a lot different from another region so you can apply that kind of micro climate to your monsters and your different humanoids that you have in your fantasy world so very interesting thing to think about and possibly consider as you build out your settings. Here we have an article on layering for dynamic encounters. So essentially you can change up, you can go from a kind of bland entry like a tomb with eight skeletons to something a lot more interesting as you add in things like unique description, weapon mix, stretch but not changing the stat block terrain and objectives so you can really kind of make a different encounter become a, a lot more alive and interesting to your players rather than just a single tomb with a bunch of skeletons milling about in it we have an article on fey bargains that's always interesting if your players run into a lot of fey you can have them offer up different things for either rewards or information from the Fey, always a dangerous place to meddle and bargain amongst, but you can get some interesting stuff in, in return. Could be a good article to use with Dolmenwood as that comes out over the coming year. Next, we have this great article by Ben Robbins, Treasure Tells a Story. There is sort of this moment when your players have defeated the bad guys and post combat they're kind of waiting for you to tell them what they've won right what what they've earned as their treasure rewards from clearing out the danger and you know securing the victory and that can often be ruined when you just sort of give out flat generic treasure like 200 gold you can really sort of lean into the moment and make kind of unique treasure that lets your players sort of wonder and learn a bit more about the world around them. And you can sort of give it as an opportunity to give them an opportunity to find out and explore more about lore within your world, right? So he talks about what's more interesting, some old guy in the bar saying, hey, here's a map, go find this not so lost city, or have the heroes inadvertently stumble across a few gold coins that lead them to the hidden kingdom. That's great stuff if you can really sort of tie it in and uh, capture their imagination in that moment, which is a moment where your players are paying high attention, right? They wanna know what they've gotten as their kind of post-challenge reward. So great stuff there, really love it. Build it in your campaigns and you know go from there, it's awesome. This next article by Arnold K. I really like reactions in the mythic underworld. I just did a video on random encounters and talked a little bit about reaction roles. This one gives you some different reactions that you can maybe 
implement into your system, different monsters are going to react different ways based off their different types of roles. So if it's benevolent, they might give you a lot of assistance, whereas if you get a really negative role, they shun you. And then there's things like neutral, guardians. So guardians will try to attack and drive you off, um, but maybe they won't leave whatever they're protecting. You know, whereas something hostile could could really sort of attack you outright. Love this article by Eric about dragon should be unique. I really like that idea in my own campaign. I'm building dragons are individualized. They're unique. They don't have kind of that standard color coding system. Um, Gary, the Gygaxian impulse to categorize everything talks about that. So it's yeah, I, I love it. It's great. Dragons, you know, let them be their own unique challenge. Let your players learn how to fight them and face them rather than, you know, red equals fire. So uh, different, you basically roll different dice to get different information about the dragon and you kind of compile it into one unique dragon. And then the next article just talks about rolling on those tables and building an example dragon, in this case, the Everworm. Next, we have the Menagerie of Monstrosities. So this is a section in all of the Nox where you get different monsters. So we have things like the Mob Demon and the Mirror Mare. Uh, this one's interesting. I like this. There's four villains. So these are kind of larger monsters or kind of villains, if you want, that are unique and that your players can face off against. So it uh, presents a few different ones. We have the Chimera King there. Very cool artwork on these ones. Neril, the Pale Huntress, so kind of this undead centaur. Terpiscor, the Devil Swan, and Ramadir, the Blade Bear. Next, we have the retinue of rogues. This is kind of the section on new player classes. So again, in my opinion, hit or miss on these, but uh, nice to have a few different options. And you know, if you want to include them in your campaign or your game, you can you know, provide them to your players so they can they can roll them up. So we have the ghoul blooded here, the inquisitor, which I think is a cleric, but instead of magic, they pronounce judgments. Sinocephalus, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Basically a canine type player race. Skiapod, so a one footed humanoid that you can play. Very interesting. And then we have extraordinary excursions. So this is going to be a few different adventures. So we have the Swamp Renewal, Grandma's Cottage. This is an adventure where a witch kind of takes over a old gnome mine. Then we have a Fistful of Feathers. This is essentially an adventure where your party can venture out in the wilderness to find this rare goose that has some feathers. The king is looking for the feathers to make a nice soft bed for themselves. Lastly, we have the Mountain Hall of the Iron Witch. This is an adventure where, uh, again, another witch seems to have captured a bunch of hostages in a mine, and they are working to harvest enough material for her to build this kind of iron suit. This last section is a special section in Knock 4. It talks about uh, welcome to the old school, uh, introducing your 5e friends to the OSR systems, added in after the OGL debacle. So there are a lot of different articles on that. Great one by Daniel Norton, talks about the different elements of, you know, that make up an old school campaign. So you have, you know, your story kind of comes from emergent storytelling, character sheet, skills or kind of lack thereof in, in OSR style games, procedures, and combat. So great, great kind of primer there. Dan Masters talks about why he created Deathbringer and sort of that minimalism element there. Kelsey Dion talks about how she problem solved her way into designing Shadow Dark, the largely uh, successful Kickstarter system that happened in 2023. A lot of people really enjoying that system. It seems like it's a nice uh, new growing community. And she kind of talks about the different elements or problems that she thought were there and, and sought to solve through Shadow Dark. So great information there. And then Lex Mandrake talks about from 5e to 5b. So that is Knock. My final thoughts on it overall are it's um, pretty great. Uh, if you enjoy Knock, you're getting a lot more of the same, a ton of different articles in there that give you different tools, ideas, information, character classes, monsters, adventures to use in your games. In that fashion, it is fantastic. 
The main drawbacks in my mind are a couple. First off, the price is a little bit steep. They are based in France. And if you're not in France, it is a little bit steeper shipping to rest of the world if you want the physical copy. Uh, at the time of recording this, it is 30 euros for the book and then 14 euros if you are shipping it outside of France. I believe it was six and a half if you're inside of France. So all told, you're 44 euro in. If you convert that to US dollars, that is about 48 dollars at the time of recording this video. So not the cheapest book. Uh, if you want just the PDF, it is about 19 euro or roughly $20. So, but you know, that price uh, can be prohibitive to some people. So just keep that in mind. You know, it is uh, an art product as much as it is an information product. So sometimes the information gets obscured a little bit by the art. Sometimes the, the formatting they choose is, you know, not the best or the most practical for uh, getting your information. Uh, it's kind of part of their, their quirk and their system. Like, you know, so the, for example, here, your text is kind of slanted. Um, does that really add a lot to you? No, not necessarily in my opinion. So just keep that in mind as you kind of look at some of these, some of them are a little bit hard to read. And then lastly, uh, for me, uh, because it is sort of a bric-a-brac by its nature, you have so much articles that aren't really cohesive, you do have to kind of know what information you were looking for. And as knock continues to grow, you know, there's going to be more issues and you're going to, you might wonder, where did I read that one article? So you're going to have to kind of search through a few or, you know, look through here to try to figure out what article it was. But overall, those are pretty minor quibbles. Um, so don't take them too heavily. I do love the product. I have all four issues. Uh, I think they're great. There are definitely articles that I've read throughout them where I'm like, wow, that is really good information. I'm glad I read that. I think about it a lot. I go back, look at it. Uh, Knock is a product where I definitely, if I'm bored or if I'm just sort of want to be inspired, I definitely pull them off the shelves and I'll, I'll flip through them or read the table of contents to kind of find that information and be sort of sparked again. All in all, great product. Mary Mushman are doing really great work. I'm very happy that they continue to make Knock and their other products. Check it out if, if it seems like of interest to you. Uh, that's going to do it for, for us here at the Earthboat and the Knock issue four review. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.